All right, I'll get started. My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is November 9th, 2022. It's one o'clock and I call this meeting to order. Um, a really quick administrative update to the agenda. Um, we are gonna enter into an executive session. Um, we have a, a person who's applied for an employee ID card that has a presumptively disqualifying offense. Our staff has reviewed the case and would like to present um, their recommendation to us and the supporting um, reasons um, why this person has overcome the presumptive disqualification uh, decision. And so we would like to um, enter an executive session, session um, after um, the staff has presented all recommendations and before we vote on them. So um, uh, we've, we've invited um, Susanna Davis, the Executive Director of Racial Equity, and Jay Green um, from the Office of Racial Equity to join us in executive session. And um, didn't take long, I don't think. Um, product registration. Um, we have some important issues on the agenda today, so I'm going to be brief. Um, you know, I'm very grateful to see so many people um, registering their products. Um, I can tell from the licensing team that there is some frustration in the industry over the pace of our approvals. You know, the primary reason for the backlog um, in our approvals is first and foremost the resources um, that we have here at the board. Uh, product registration approval um, lives with our licensing staff, who is simultaneously doing this. Um, they're also reviewing license applications and employee ID card approvals. And the more we uh, focus our resources on product registration, the less capacity we have for actually getting businesses, their licenses and their employees licensed. Um, we've made the decision to shift a portion of our compliance team's workload to reviewing product registration, which should help speed up the process. Um, the secondary reason that it's been slow on our end um, is we have a temporary process in place um, which utilizes sale, uh, Microsoft Teams, um, not Salesforce. It's not very streamlined. Um, if we get partial, um, partially complete product registration forms um, where the test results um, or the packaging information um, doesn't come in at the same time as the rest of the form, we, all, we have to kind of piece all of this together on the back end manually. There's no automation to it and all the communication aspects um, are not automated like they will be in Salesforce. Um, we do have an RFP, or we had to put out an RFP for the Salesforce integration for product registration. Um, it's uh, being developed currently, um, it's being built, should be done by the end of the year. Um, when that is in place, it will cut out a huge amount of the backend work that um, we have to do to get product, products registered. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, in the meantime, you know, we're going to try and get a wave of them done utilizing um, some of our uh, compliance team's uh, resources. Um, um, I know that uh, there was a question about us publishing a list of registered products. Um, we don't have the capacity to do that right now. Um, you know, anyone. A retailer can always ask the person they're purchasing products from um, to see the product registration. Um, and you can always email us if you're a retailer looking to see if a product that you want to sell has been registered. Um, that email address is ccb.products at vermont.gov. Um, just a reminder that product registration is very important to the long term success of this market. Um, we don't want to jeopardize people's licenses or Vermont's reputation for quality by getting unregistered products into the market. Um, you know, I know people are sinking a lot of money into their operations um, and people want to have a diversity of products on their shelves, um, but, you know, we need to only sell registered products. So the other updates. Um, we have two um, new positions that have been posted. Uh, you can go to the Vermont uh, Human Resources website to look at those and apply for those. Uh, one final reminder 
that our staff is organizing a live Q&A session. Um, the focus of this Q&A session is on testing and inventory tracking and product registration. The date is um, November 21st, so it'll be at 7 p.m. And the link to join is uh, posted on our website. Please you know, collect all your questions about testing, inventory tracking, product registration, and bring them to that Q&A session, and hopefully we can get you some answers. Um, other than that, just need to approve our minutes from our last meeting on uh, uh, November 2nd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, moving through the agenda, um, Carrie, are you with us? Carrie's going to do a um, hemp policy update if he's there. I'm going to do that. Oh, you are? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great. All right. <laughs> Gary has any plans to do it. All right. Um, okay. I don't need this right now. Um, yep. So this is just a, a, a brief update on the board's hemp policy. Um, last Friday, the board posted an industry bulletin on hemp and hemp derived high THC products uh, to our website. And that bulletin was really designed to give um, both hemp growers and processors in the state an early roadmap um, on the board's approach to hemp products that are going to be entering the market. Um, so to start, I should back up a little bit and say that last legislative session, uh, the General Assembly transferred the regulatory authority over hemp um, and hemp derived products from the Agency of Agriculture to the Cannabis Control Board. And that specifically included the authority to regulate synthetic cannabinoids and hemp derived cannabinoids, including Delta-8 and Delta-10 THC. So what does that mean um, for the hemp growers and processors in the state? For hemp growers, um, hemp cultivators are currently required to register with the um, Agency of Agriculture. But at the end of this calendar year, um, the agency is going to withdraw its USDA-approved hemp production plans. And so in 2023, hemp growers are going to be required to register with the USDA um, to continue to cultivate hemp in compliance with federal law. So the board is not going to oversee hemp growers. Um, hemp processors, however, the board does have the authority over regulating businesses that are manufacturing hemp-derived products. And we are required by the legislature to submit a report um, to the General Assembly in January that lays out our plan for regulating hemp processors and hemp derived products. Um, so this is really kind of an early conversation about what our plan is, um, since we have not yet written our rules governing hemp producers or hemp products. So our plan is to offer two paths um, for hemp producers and hemp products. So first, for hemp processors that intend to produce products with less than one milligram of THC per serving, the board is going to develop a registration system that will have similar requirements to those that were administered by the Agency of Agriculture. For hemp processors that intend to produce products with one or more milligrams of THC per serving, um, those processors are going to be required to get a cannabis establishment manufacturing license. Um, retailers that are wanting to sell these products are also going to need to get a cannabis establishment retail license. So these hemp derived products with a milligram or more of THC per serving are going to need to undergo the same testing, labeling and packaging requirements as cannabis and cannabis products. And they're also going to need to be registered before they can be sold in a retail establishment. Um, I, as the chair has mentioned in previous meetings, our compliance team has pulled um, hemp derived products from retailer shelves that were non-compliant with the rule and contain greater than one milligram or more of THC per serving. These products the board is really viewing as being intended for the adult use market and therefore are going to need to comply with adult use market regulations. Um, so I wanna emphasize that uh, the board is going to go through its regular rulemaking process on hemp processors and hemp derived products. Um, and that's going to be happening in the coming months. There's going to be ample opportunity as always um, for the public to weigh in on the policies that the board is developing prior to those policies becoming rule. 
And I also want to acknowledge that um, there's like a constant evolution of cannabis law and policy, both at the state level and at the federal level, um, that could inform changes to um, the way that the board is going to regulate hemp-derived products. And we will continue to provide um, public bulletins as that policy develops. Any questions for Brent about that? No. no. Thank you, Brent. All right, and now um, next on the agenda, we're going to review advertising guidance. I think, Julie, you're going to do that? Yes. Okay. I think I should probably put the guidance up on the screen for okay. folks. If that will reach over, otherwise I can just go through it. It should reach. No, oh, it'll reach. to be here up there oh there it goes should and we might have to like act as if that's a second screen to your right there we go all right so um this this guidance is up on our website now um and you know i thought we would go through it just to make sure that folks are clear on what's in there highlight some things um, for folks to go back and look at later so that you know where to reference, um, you know, this advertising information, because it is it is incredibly important that um, that we are looking at and following this, this guidance and um, what we've laid out for ourselves as expectations. So excuse the scrolling for a moment. <clears throat> so um, just to remind everyone what advertising is and what advertising is not. An advertisement is a, a publication or a dissemination of an advertisement, and um, it means any written or verbal statement, illustration, or depiction that is calculated to induce sales of cannabis or cannabis products. So, and that um, inducement of sales is important to remember, um, you know, meaning to persuade or influence. So keep that in mind as we go through um, this guidance. Um, so that includes anything that's written, printed, uh, graphics, material, billboard, sign, any other outdoor display, periodical literature, publication, radio, or television, broadcast, uh, internet, or any other media. And you can find those definitions right on the legislature's website in law. What is not advertising is the label affixed to the product. Um, you know, any editorial or or reading material such as like a news release or a periodical publication. So if somebody, if your local paper does a story about your store, that's not necessarily an advertisement. Um, educational or instructional material and the sign that's attached to the premises identifying it as the cannabis establishment. However, even though those things are not advertisements, they still need to follow the sort of general advertising restriction, restrictions, which you can see down here. Um, and sort of from here to kind of like the next, through the next page, it talks about what is not allowed for advertising content. And so here are the things that I want folks to remember. Um, advertisements cannot include false or misleading uh, claims. So that means the test results have to be accurate. The THC content has to be accurate. Whatever's in the ad has to be an accurate statement. Um, can't promote overconsumption. Uh, can't claim curative effects of cannabis or cannabis products, can't offer a prize, award, or an, an, any other inducement. So it can't be a buy one, get one, um, you know, can't be a, a, a sale. Discounts are allowed, but an advertisement of a discount or an advertisement of like a buy one, get one. Is not allowed. Um, it can have an advertisement for free samples. And just as a reminder, samples to consumers are not allowed. We do have... Um, rules around samples for vendors and employees, but not for the public. So consumer samples are not allowed. Um, and it cannot appeal to or depict a person under the age of 21. And I'll talk more about 
um, that last one there um, in a little bit about how to avoid um, appealing to those under the age of 21. So moving through the guidance. I would just note also, this is all from the statute. Yep. You know, people trying to appeal to us about changing this is just not, you're asking the wrong people. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, limitations there, and these are some of the most restrictive advertising restrictions in the country. Um, so um, it's not really on us to, to change these. We're just following the law here. That's right. And I, I guess I should have said at the start, the point of this guidance is to help explain what's in the statute, right. not to create another set of rules or policy to follow. It's really just a helpful explanation of what, what it is we're all supposed to be following. Um, so moving through this, a reminder that um, it is required that folks include the warning label in the, in their advertising. Um, and as a board, you know, we were not prescriptive about where or how that um, warning label had to appear in the advertising other than it needs to be um, clearly visible. It can't be covered by other images or as a watermark. And we have some examples here in the guidance um, to, to demonstrate that. So you can see the, the example on the left shows the warning label very clearly. The example on the right does not. The example on the left is okay. The one on the right is not. So to your point, um, Chair Pepper, about the restrictions um, and having the most restrictive rules in the country, um, cannabis establishments cannot advertise products via any medium unless Sorry, I have to flip the page because I can't actually see the screen. <laughs> um, unless the licensee can show that not more than 15% of the audience is reasonably expected to be under 21. And in the guidance, we have a little chart that kind of describes what that means. Um, it takes language from our rules and then kind of describes what each of those things means in a little bit more detail. So generally, the CCB assumes that 15% of the audience for all advertising is under the age of 21. And then to overcome that assumption, what cannabis establishments can do is to provide reliable and verifiable information that wherever that ad is placed, the audience um, meets that 15% criteria. And just to be clear, the responsibility for providing that reliable and verifiable information is on the licensee, not the place where the advertisement is placed. So it's not on the magazine, the TV station, the radio station to demonstrate that. The licensee needs to collect that information from those places and provide it when they submit their ad for approval or submit their ad uh, to the CCB. And on the very end of this, I'll talk about how to submit those ads. Because more than 15% of Vermont's general population is under the age of 21, it's assumed that any advertising outdoors that's viewable to the general public will not be allowed, unless, of course, uh, the person placing the advertisement, the licensee placing the advertisement, can demonstrate um, that they're meeting that 15% requirement. This, um, the 15% requirement does not have to be met for signs that are affixed to storefronts that merely say this is where your cannabis shop is. Um, it, however, those signs must still abide by the general advertising restrictions that we talked about before. Um, those kind of six or seven criteria about what advertisements can and cannot look like, those apply to labeling, it applies to your branding, and it applies to the signs outside your buildings. So social media and websites is kind of the next section of this guidance. Um, cannabis establishments may certainly have websites and may choose to use social media. However, the websites and social media must comply with those general advertising restrictions. So those same six or seven restrictions that we talked about before. And moving through that a little bit, cannabis establishment websites um, must have age gating. And so we have an example here of the age gating. Um, and like all other types of advertising, web advertising must meet that 15% rule. So cannabis establishments cannot advertise on websites that are managed by other entities unless those sites also have age gating and can, can demonstrate that meeting that 15% criteria. 
And then the next section goes into social media. And I'm just going to, I'm going to straight up read this because this is tricky. This is tricky for all of us. And I don't want anything to get lost in translation, but this is really, really important. Um, a cannabis establishment social media post must comply with the general advertising restrictions. If a social media post qualifies as an advertisement, the establishment must submit to the submit the post to the board as an advertisement as detailed later in this guidance. And I will talk about how to do that. Social media posts of images um, of cannabis, flower, or registered finished product are not that are not calculated to induce sales of cannabis or cannabis products are acceptable. Further, cannabis establishments may only promote product products using links to their age-gated websites. This means cannabis establishments cannot use shop now buttons that bring users to social media marketplace. So you can put your website on your social media account, but you can't have a post that has like a shop now that takes you to a separate uh, marketplace store on your social media um, account. Further, cannabis establishments cannot sell or advertise cannabis or cannabis products in a third party social media marketplace. So uh, you can't put it on Etsy or your buy, sell, trade um, websites or social media sites that are out there. Cannabis establishments may use the instant messaging component of a social media platform to communicate with customers. So if a customer asks you a question, you can answer it through that, that, um, that medium but may not advertise or sell cannabis products via social media, via instant messaging. Cannabis establishments may use their logo and branding on social media. Images and text on social media platforms may direct users to the cannabis establishment's website. So that's what I was mentioning before. Further, cannabis establishments may use social media platforms for general consumer information and education. Cannabis retail establishments that lawfully collect customer contact information may send text or email messages only to age verified customers. So if someone has um, opted into something in your store where you've collected their information, they've agreed to that, you can send email and text messages to that person so long as they have opted in again. Um, and any messages that qualify as an advertisement must be submitted to the board as an advertisement and I'll talk about how to submit that um, a little bit later. So this is a really important section and it's on page seven. Um, and again, this is up on our website now. Folks wanna go there and view it. So here are some examples of acceptable media, social media posts and unacceptable social media posts. And then a reminder that um, you know, general merchandise is not necessarily advertising, but it does still need to comply with the general advertising rules, meaning not appealing to children and not making um, false claims, not claiming curative effects, those six or seven criteria that we talked about at the first thing. So the next section of the guidance goes through how to avoid advertisements that are appealing to those under the age of 21. Um, and this is a requirement of state law that the advertisements not appeal to someone who's under the age of 21. And that means not using toys, inflatables, movie characters, cartoon characters. And I'll talk a little bit about what a cartoon is in a minute. No child friendly depictions of food or other consumables um, or any other display depiction or image that is designed to be appealing to minors or anyone under the age of 21. So when we're talking about, um, you know, not appealing to under 21, we mean certainly not using folks or depictions of a person who's under the age of 21 in the ad, not using cartoons um, or things that are commonly marketed to children and youth, um, and not using items that are generally more attractive to um, persons under 21. And when we're talking about cartoons, and I think this is a conversation that we had a few months ago when we were developing this guidance, cartoon is not necessarily like the style of artwork. In this case, it's the content of that artwork. So things that, um, that are cartoons in this context should not have comically exaggerated, typically human features, um, shouldn't attribute human or superhuman characteristics to animals, plants, or other objects. 
And cartoons um, appealing to children often use anamorphic technique to give animals um, and inanimate objects non or non other non-human objects like human identities. And that in this context is a cartoon for the purposes of not appealing to those who are under the age of 21 and um, should not use fonts that are typically used to attract the attention of, of young children and youth. And there's an example here of imagery to avoid. There's also some other examples of um, imagery to avoid in the labeling guidance as well. So there's plenty of, of uh, examples of things to avoid. So moving through to how to submit um, ads to the boards, they have to be submitted in a format prescribed by the board. Um, they can be submitted by email, um, generally in a PDF or in a voice or video media, if it's if that is how the ad will appear. Um, they can be submitted to ccb.advertising at vermont.gov. Um, for um, advertisements, it should the, what you send to the board should be exactly what you intend to be in the advertisement. So if you're sending a graphic image, that should be the, the, the finished product ad that you're submitting to us to, to look at. Same with um, you know, any kind of voice, radio ad, or any other type of, of media, if it's a video or what have you. Um, your, what you submit should include the locations where you expect the ad to run and the dates that it'll run and the reliable, verifiable data that the um, audience meets that 15% criteria. Um, the board will review those and will uh, look at those within 10 business days. Oh, sorry, to go back. Um, ads need to be submitted 15 days before they're expected to run, and then the board will, it, will look at them within 10 business days. So submit them 15 days before you intend for them to run, and it will take the board roughly 10 days to look at those. Um, and then once it's approved, it has to appear exactly as it was submitted to the board. So that's sort of the rundown of this guidance. Um, again, it's up on our website. The instructions on how to submit are there. Um, folks around the table, is there anything I left out or should address? No. I, I mean, I know it's complicated. Um, you know, we have learned some lessons in the past few decades around cartoon imagery and, um, you know, things that might be appealing to youth. We're going to try and apply those lessons learned to this space um, and just do the best we can to get through this. It's complicated. Yeah, it, it is complicated. I think we all recognize that and, and as a society these days we're so used to putting so much of our business and personal life out on the internet and i think before folks hit the post button make sure that you feel like you're compliant and if you have questions please ask them there are a lot of folks around the state still that want to see this industry not succeed and this is something that they're going to continuously <laughs> go back towards and it is you know, I, I think New York actually might be beating us in terms of being more restrictive. Than I us. have heard that, yeah. Um, but we're certainly at the top. But together, we can we can figure out ways so I think folks can still market their products in a safe, effective way. I guess the only thing I would add is that the advertising review process is not a fee-based process. Um, you know, the legislature decided not to attach a fee to the review. Um, by the CCB. So, you know, with the floodgates open, we get swamped. It can take a while for us to review these, but um, really, you know, the idea is check in with the board before you put an advertisement out. Um, it's, it's much, you know, we will get through it. There's no, you know, there's no fee associated with this. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think we're up to, um, review the applications for this week. Okay, so here is your register for this week. Um, starting with the medical program, here are our numbers for this week. Um, we've been pretty steady with the incoming numbers of renewal applications and new applications. So getting through those as best we can. Um, moving on to the adult 
the adult use license application numbers, um, that these numbers are current as of yesterday. So um, looking at the total numbers, um, we've got 37 new applications in the last seven days. Um, the majority of those, as always um, lately, are going to be employee ID card applications. We have gotten four new um, cannabis establishment applications. Three of those are um, small cultivator applications, and one is a new retail application. So I'm going to move on to the location. This is our chart that... Um, describes the location of all retail um, licensees and retail applicants that are still in the queue. So just a reminder, this is um, all retail establishments, those that have been licensed and those that are, that are still in process. Um, the team ran a new report uh, for these retail establishments. So these numbers look a little bit different than um, last, week num last week's numbers. And actually, what this new report reveals is that there's a little bit less density um, of retail establishments in the Burlington area. So you'll see that there, and this chart looks a little different too, because it has the status, actually reveals the status of where um, in the queue these applications are. Um, so you'll see there's only six Burlington um, establishments there. Um, and I just want to make one note, which is that this report was run just on retail establishments, so it does not include the integrated license um, that is in Burlington that has a retail outlet. So um, this new report will inform the numbers that go to the website, um, because I do think it's a little bit more accurate. It weeded out um, like a test application. So I think that that accounted for the difference between the number of uh, Burlington establishments that were indicated on last week's register and this one. So I'll move on to our um, recommendations for approval of a license. So these are the applicants this week that have demonstrated that they have complied with all the requirements for their license that are contained both in statute and in board rule. Um, we, we have first up Humble Skunk applying for an indoor tier one cultivation license. Um, Subterra Cannabis applying for an indoor tier two cultivation license. Somewhere on the Mountain applying for a retail license. Clover VT applying for a retail license. Vermont Hemp Craft LLC applying for a retail license. Emerald Rose Retail, applying for a retail license. Oho Roho Cannabis, applying for a wholesaler license. Quintessential Botanicals, applying for an outdoor tier three cultivation license. Epona Farms, applying for a retail license. And Dis District 802, applying for a tier one manufacturing license. <clears throat> um, we also have a recommendation, as the chair mentioned at the outset. This week, we have a recommendation for an employee ID card. Um, so staff is recommending approval of an employee ID card for submission number 1857, as staff um, have determined that this applicant meets the criteria for their employee ID card pursuant to board rule 116.4. And this is the applicant that the board will discuss in executive session today. Um, so moving on to our amendments, we've got the same number of amendments that we had last week. Um, here are our social equity application numbers. We do have two new, two of the four new applicants for a cannabis establishment license um, have identified themselves as social equity applicants. So our total number in the queue is up to 122. And that's where we are this week. Great. So um, any questions for Brent about these? Nope. Um, all right. So we're going to go into executive session to discuss the staff recommendation around the employee ID card approval. You know, we don't make any decisions in executive session. We just hear the underlying facts and the rationale for the recommendation. Um, and then we come out and we vote. Um, so I think this one will probably take less than 10 minutes, but why don't we just say 10 minutes? Um, yep, I think that's a good, it's a good estimate. So um, 
Is there a motion to enter into executive session? I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney-client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body and that executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage. I further move that the board invite Susanna Davis and Jay Green from the Office of Racial Equity into executive session. Oh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, Nellie, um, why don't we say 145 <laughs> for return? Sounds good. Okay. There you go. Great. All right. Um, so, um, we're back. It's 146 p.m. And uh, we're out of executive session. We heard the underlying facts of the kind of staff recommendation and their rationale. And I think we are ready to vote on all of the staff recommendations. I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, I think. Uh, Yep, why don't we shift to public comment? Um, and I would just remind folks that we can't, the board here cannot answer questions directly about advertising or whatever. Um, you know, we are gonna have a live Q&A session with our staff um, very soon, November 21st, where you can bring questions um, that can get answered in real time. But um, we'll do our, Public comment, the same as always. We'll start with the people that joined on the phone or via the link. And if you have a comment, please raise your virtual hand. Then we'll shift to people that joined on the phone. Dave. Hey, uh, thanks everyone. Um, just wanted to um, point out that two of the retailers uh, approved today uh, are also tier one cultivators. And I think that's pretty cool um, that tier one cultivators are finding a direct path to market. Uh, and that's my comment. Thank you. Good point. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. Keith. Keith. Hello, board. How are you today? Fine, thanks. Good. I have a couple of comments. I'll try to go through them quick. Comment one, I'd like to see a flow chart of weekly sales of products built. I'd like to see a flow chart of male owned businesses to female owned businesses to BIPOC to lesbian, gay, bi, transgender businesses. A flow chart of employees to men to women plus BIPOC, lesbian, bi, gay, bi, transgender, disabled and veterans. Um, I'd like to see a list of all licensed information open data set with a final executive report for business and is in an enforcement inspection report with the recommendations to establishments. I'd like to also see, I don't see any guidance on your website for transporting cannabis from grower to cultivator to processor to manufacturer to wholesale to retail type and licenses. And what type of insurance these people would have to carry and what safety protocols do you guys want to implant and security measures or GPS monitoring on the vehicle type of registration and the type of vehicle registered with the CCB. I'd like to see a guidance for consumers about products and harms and safety, a guidance for parents. Um, I want to know if you're building a social equity program for people that want to enter the market but are not guaranteed a license. Uh, a flow chart of all municipalities with bylaws and ordinances. An enforcement action section from Kerry because he's the lead enforcement action person. And I also think that there should be a reporting form, agent reporting form for COVID reporting forms, because we're still in the day and age of COVID and people still get it. And it should be noted that there's some type of form that they can submit to you guys that have the COVID report. I'd also like to see a, know if you guys, if it's possible that you guys are certified through the Safe Vendor Training Program and you could post up your certifications that every staff member in the CCB has gone through safe vendor training. And I also don't know if you guys didn't see it on the website, if manufacturers in the state of Vermont have to go through safe serve vendor training and safe serve for manufacturing, working with edibles, and that they get certified as well and all employees have to be certified. I worked in the department 
in the food service industry, and I had to be certified to work with food through Safe Server Vermont. Um, and I'd like to know if Bryn is building a leadership team under her that will consist of people like a chief technology and innovation officer, a director of research officer, a chief financial accountants officer, a chief communications officer, a chief operating officer, and a chief people officer, which would be human resources, because we're working in the day of human resources. And I also want to make one more statement. I don't see any guidance on IRS federal tax 280E that deals with cannabis on the federal levels for taxations. And this is very important because with tax and regulation and with the SHIP Act, it may change. And I know that can happen, but 280E is a federal tax where every business has to pay a tax on the federal level, not just the state and local tax levels. And I didn't see that anything in your tax and regulate recently in the tax section when I looked it up. Those are my comments for today. Thank you for your time. Hope it will always be a pleasure to help you and assist you in any way. We would love to come work for you. If you hire me, I'd be really happy. And we could do some things to understand you're short-staffed. Thank you. Yep. Th thanks, Keith. And, you know, I know we have some of that information you requested in your first comments. So please just submit those as public records requests. Hey guys, how are you again? Uh, thank you very much for what you're doing and continue to push them through. Uh, I have just a comment about the rollout with the with the hemp products, uh, and it has to do with uh, lab testing. Uh, I just wanna um, put on your on on your radar that uh, when I was starting to open up our lab. Uh, we thought about doing hemp, uh, although we learned that, that you had to report to the DEA um, when you're doing that. Uh, just um, so when we get into the Q and A in the 2021st, uh, it's on your radar. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Harry. Anyone else um, who joined by the link, please just raise your virtual hand, and um, if you're on the phone and would like to make a public comment, you can hit star six to unmute your phone. Phone number ending in 5077 has unmuted. Hello, am I being heard by the board's yeah. meeting today? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bill, and uh, I'm certainly uh, very amazed and impressed by the complexity of what you have managed and, and gotten through so far. Congratulations. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention an article that appeared in the bridge of uh, this week, November 2nd through the 15th, titled uh, First Local Retail Pot Shops Open. And let me just read you uh, what I am uh, referring to. Uh, this is verbatim from the article. It says, upon entering the store, a customer is required to present identification, such as a driver's license. This is scanned and put into a database. The customer is then allowed to shop. I don't know, maybe the board is certainly probably aware of this, but if not, I just wanted to raise a, a couple issues on it that might be addressed in at some later uh, meeting or a Q&A or possibly on the website. One, it was, there was no, for, I've talked to several people who have walked in and, and had their uh, ID scanned. There was no identification that PII was being sent to a database. It's also a question of why is it being collected? Who owns this data? Uh, what will it be used for? And is it a public record? So those are, I just wanted to bring that to your attention in case that, uh, is a concern of some people that their PII is being loaded into a, a database without their knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. We'll um, get some information about that and talk about it at our next meeting. Okay, thank you. I'll, how do I D, do I star six to, to D mute? Uh, I, think, I think Nelly can actually do it for you. Um, if okay. you're done, she can do thanks. it. Yeah. All right, yeah. thanks, Nelly. That, that's it, bye. Anyone else for a public comment? All right. Well, I'll close the public comment window and um, 
there's nothing else to add, I will adjourn the meeting. No. Good. All right. Thanks everyone for joining.